Well, then we have general questions. Question one, Margaret McDougall. Apologies, presiding officer. You're late, Ms McDougall. I apologise. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in setting up the public consultation on fracking. Minister Fergus Ewing. Presiding uh, officer, ministers have been meeting with representatives from community, environmental and industry groups to discuss the consultation and our pre-consultation preparations. We will continue to take a participative approach in the lead up to and during this important consultation and further details of the consultation and accompanying work will be announced in due course. Margaret McDougall. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer. The issue of underground coal gasification was not included in the temporary moratorium on shale gas and coal bed methane. I ask the Minister to clarify whether the Scottish Government supports the process of underground coal gasification so there are no doubts on this issue. And if they do not support it, then why is it not included in the temporary moratorium? And will the Minister now commit the Scottish Government to including underground coal gasification in the moratorium until proper and robust evidence is collected and the public consultation has been completed? Minister. Uh, well, I'm happy to reassure the member that the Scottish Government uh, take environmental protection as uh, of paramount importance. But of course, the moratorium, which uh, I announced, presiding officer, on I believe the 28th of January, uh, was specifically about onshore technologies involving hydraulic fracturing and coal bed methane. Uh, and it is uh, correct to point out that underground coal gasification employs a different technology and is not covered by the moratorium. Madam Fraser. Uh, can, can the Minister tell us to what extent the consultation will be evidence-based, given that the Scottish Government's own independent scientific panel, which reported last July, concluded that fracking could be conducted safely in Scotland if properly regulated? Minister. Uh, well, I'm pleased to confirm to Murdo Fraser that our approach in, uh, with regard to this whole policy area is that we take a cautious evidence-based approach. Uh, one, I think, that uh, his own party called for in a previous policy document. Uh, so we will continue to take that approach. And that is why I, I think uh, the public have welcomed the fact that we put in place a, a moratorium. Uh, I hope that all parties support the moratorium, incidentally, but we are still waiting for confirmation of whether that is or is not the, the situation. But we will continue to take an evidence-based approach and the group to which uh, he referred to did specifically identify gaps, some gaps that need to be filled. And therefore, it is appropriate that we consider further evidence on areas such as the potential or possible impacts on public health, on the environment in respect of the hydraulic fraction process itself and what that entails, but also areas such as the impact on traffic and transport. And as I pointed out frequently, presiding officer, Scotland is not North Dakota. The central belt where deposits are believed to be situated is densely populated. We must therefore consider very carefully and take the time to do so all of these important matters that quite rightly and understandably are of considerable importance to the general public. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Minister will recall that I tabled a question 12 weeks ago and wrote to him personally six weeks ago to ask whether his moratorium covered the drilling of conventional boreholes with a view to doing fracking later. Can he today answer that question? Does it cover exploratory drilling or not? First minute, uh, Minister. Uh, well, I, I announced uh, the, uh, the moratorium on the 28th of January, and that announcement was very clear in its terms. I am aware that uh, Mr Macdonald, presiding officer, has raised a number of questions, and uh, to that end, I actually arm myself with the reply, which I wrote to him on the 20th of April, stating that these matters are all receiving very careful attention. I think it's reasonable to point out that Mr Macdonald did ask a very large number of questions. And therefore, in order to make sure that the, the questions are correct and indeed evidence-based, we will take uh, proper time to consider all of the many issues, including the one that he has singled out today, and to make sure that they are answered fully in due course. Question two, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its position on the recommendations of the Smith Commission. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the recommendations of the Smith Commission offer an opportunity to provide the Scottish Parliament with further powers to improve the lives of the people of Scotland, although many of the key levers to boost growth and promote fairness will remain reserved to Westminster. 
The draft clauses published by the United Kingdom Government in January fall short of the Smith recommendations in a number of areas, and the Scottish Government is continuing to engage with the UK Government to secure improvements before the proposed Scotland Bill is introduced in the House of Commons. Roderick Campbell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It's quite clear that the Smith Commission is not the last word on the question of more powers for this Parliament. Indeed, the Daily Telegraph, the House Journal of the Conservatives, on Saturday in its editorial indicated that proposed powers may not be enough. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure us that the Scottish Government will continue to press the case for additional powers as robustly as possible? Cabinet Secretary. President, let me confirm two points to, uh, to, to Mr Campbell. Uh, the first is that the Government will continue in its efforts to ensure that the recommendations made by the Smith Commission are actually effectively legislated for. And I take this opportunity to welcome the report of the Devolution for the Powers Committee of the Parliament that was published this morning, which had all party agreement, which uh, on a, a, what I thought was a, a thoroughly dispassionately and a considered wording uh, of the report it set out a number of deficiencies in the wording of the uh, Scotland Bill, draft Scotland Bill clauses that we've set out. And I look forward to pursuing those issues with the United Kingdom Government um, with the assistance of the very carefully worded um, report of the uh, committee, which has been supported unanimously by all parties and all members. And secondly, I assure Mr Campbell that the Government will uh, continue to raise um, and to argue for there to be additional powers. That was what the Government fought the, or the Scottish National Party fought the election in May uh, about. Uh, we, said, we set out the arguments for additional powers and we will take every opportunity to advance that argument. And as the First Minister confirmed to Parliament yesterday, we expect to have such an opportunity uh, when the First Minister meets with the Prime Minister uh, in early course. Annabel Goldie. Uh, may I ask the Scottish Government if it intends to seek evidence and engage in civic consultation in relation to its Smith Plus proposals? I, I think that would be uh, advantageous and beneficial. I think one of the, despite the efforts of Lord Smith to engage widely with the stakeholder community in Scotland, uh, I would have to say, as a participant within the Smith Commission, this is my view, I appreciate Ms. Barnes Goldie was on that commission with me and she will have her view, but in my opinion, um, we were not able to sufficiently engage with the wider um, uh, body politic of Scotland on many of these questions. So, uh, yes, it would be my position on that question. I think it is essential that the views of the wider community in Scotland are considered very uh, closely to the decision making that we make on all of these questions. Question three, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government when the next meeting of the Joint Exchequer Committee will take place and what will be discussed. Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. Presiding officer, the date of the next meeting of the Joint Exchequer Committee has not been set. Lord Smith recommended that the intergovernmental machinery between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments needed urgent reform. We need to put in place appropriate governance arrangements that will support the implementation of the Smith Commission's financial provisions. This is something I want to discuss with the new United Kingdom Government at the earliest opportunity. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. And in fact, uh, much of what he said is preempted in my supplementary. I mean, I mean, whilst there are other uh, intergovernmental bodies, such as the Joint Ministerial Committee, uh, the Joint Exchequer Committee has not met for more than two years. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree that if additional powers are to be devolved, if devolved effectively, such uh, uh, intergovernmental bodies must meet regularly? Uh, and on a transparent footing to allow effective scrutiny by this Parliament. Cabinet Secretary. I agree with Mr Gibson's points, and uh, I think one of the issues that has um, affected the, the meeting programme of the Joint Exchequer Committee and the fact that you know, Mr Gibson is absolutely correct it hasn't met for two years is the fact that there has been, um, we have been unable to reach agreement on some of the elementary arrangements about the implementation of even the Kalman Commission proposals. And, Part of that, I think, has been, uh, uh, could be ascribed to the, the fact that there is an unwillingness to consider some of the alternative perspective that is put forward by the Scottish Government uh, to counter some of the uh, requirements and the positions put forward by Her Majesty's Treasury. Now, if intergovernmental machinery is to work effectively, uh, then we have to work on the basis of respect between different governments of the United Kingdom. And uh, I welcome what the Prime Minister said on Friday, that he intended to govern by respect. And I hope we will see some of those uh, sentiments evidenced in the implementation of the intergovernmental machinery, uh, in examples such as the Joint Exchequer Committee. Jackie Bailey. 
Can I agree with much of what the Cabinet Secretary has said about effective intergovernmental machinery? So whether it's through the Joint Exchequer Committee or indeed another intergovernmental mechanism, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will want to pursue his policy of full fiscal responsibility. Given that that's the case, could he perhaps outline a timetable for achieving this? Cabinet Secretary. I think that these issues, as I gave, responded to my answer to Barney Goldie a moment ago, uh, these issues are essentially... Um, uh, now to be taken forward in the dialogue that we have directly with UK ministers. Uh, we expect a, a, a discussion with the Prime Minister to take place um, uh, relatively soon, uh, which will enable some of these issues to begin to be explored. Um, the timetable for any implementation will be dependent on reaching agreement in this discussion. Uh, but I also say to Jackie Bale and reiterate the point I made to, to Barnes Goldie that uh, the approach the Scottish Government will want to take will be one to engage with and to consult with the wider community within Scotland. Uh, this cannot quite simply be uh, a government-to-government -government discussion. Uh, there are perfectly appropriate government-to-government -government discussions to happen, uh, but it is essential that we have discussions with the wider uh, community within Scotland to ensure that our uh, proposals uh, are taken forward in a fashion that commands support within Scotland. Question four, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it is providing to increase affordable housing in rural and remote areas. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government is committed to the, to the provision of affordable housing across Scotland. We know that the housing system is different in remote and rural areas and a resource allocation and subsidy system both recognise this. We are currently working with a range of rural stakeholders to develop a rural housing initiative. This will complement the excellent work that local authorities and housing, housing associations are doing and will aim in particular to support the work of community groups to increase housing availability in remote and rural areas. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer. Following the lifting of the moratorium on rural school closures, we have seen a number of local authorities across the Highlands and Islands rush to close rural schools. Does she agree with me? that local planning departments need to take a more proactive approach towards maintaining the sustainability of rural communities and take a more enlightened approach towards delivering housing in these areas. Minister. I would reassure the member that we well recognise that small numbers of houses in rural areas can make a real difference to the sustainability of that area and I've visited a number of projects uh, seeing that for myself. But the Scottish Government supports sustainable economic growth for all of our communities. Our national planning framework sets out a vision for vibrant rural areas with growing sustainable communities supported by new opportunities and employment for employment and education. The vision is further supported by Scottish planning policy, policy, which sets out clearly the expectation that in all rural and island areas, the planning system should encourage rural development that supports prosperous and sustainable communities and businesses while protecting and enhancing environmental quality. Question number five, Sierra Boyack. I know Ms Boyack is not in the seat to ask her question. Can I just say that I deplore the fact that no prior information has been given to me as to why she is not here? I would expect an explanation from Ms Boyack by the end of the session. Question number six, in the name of Patricia Ferguson, has not been lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Question number seven, Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Neil Bibby. <coughs> I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will want to join me in paying tribute to the staff at the RH in Paisley for their continued efforts to reduce waiting times for patients. However, many of these staff members are telling us there aren't enough beds or staff at the hospital. So in light of her new A&E action plan announced this week, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what concrete steps she will take to increase staff and bed numbers at the RH to ensure we avoid the repeat of the crisis we saw at the hospital last winter? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, I would want to join with Neil Bibby in congratulating the staff uh, at the, the RH. 
not least that the performance uh, in A&E on the most recent figures uh, ending the 3rd of May has shown that uh, those uh, who were treated within the four-hour target was 89.6%, a very substantial improvement from the 75% uh, recorded at the end of February. So I absolutely want to put on record my thanks to the staff there. And of course, that was supported by the improvement team who have been working very closely with uh, staff at the RAH and other hospitals to make those improvements. The resource, the £9 million I announced yesterday, was of course part of a £50 million unscheduled care package to uh, increase the number of a &E consultants, which of course have gone up by 170% uh, under this government, a substantial increase indeed. And of course that resource will help to ensure that the resilience within our hospitals is increased as we make preparations towards uh, this winter. So I can absolutely assure Neil Bibby that I will do absolutely everything to make sure that our hospitals are staffed and um, are prepared for uh, the winter pressures that will uh, emerge uh, this winter and I'm very confident that uh, we are in a good place to do that. Question number eight in the name of Cara Hilton has not been lodged. The member has provided me with an explanation which I do not consider acceptable. Question number nine, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure communities are protected from dangerous dogs. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to policies that will help make our communities safer from out of control and dangerous dogs. We are pleased that the latest figures show that local authorities are making good use of their powers under the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. Initial figures show that in the year February 2014 to February 2015, local authorities issued 261 dog control notices relating to out of control dogs. The number of dog control notices issued is the highest in a single year since the Act came into force in February 2011, and this excludes four local authorities who have yet to provide the information for the latest year. We want to work with the local authorities and Police Scotland in helping use the existing powers wisely uh, relating to dogs, and we are involved in work to develop a national protocol uh, between local authorities, Police Scotland and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to ensure there is a clarity relating to powers to deal with control of dogs. In addition, the Scottish Government has recently announced it will introduce mandatory microchipping in April 2016. This will assist primarily in the welfare of the dogs, of course, uh, for example, make it easier to reunite uh, owners with their dogs, but it should also assist in the control of dogs within our communities. Paul Martin. Uh, President Officer, can I say I welcome, I welcome uh, the legislation that has been proposed by the Government, particularly in relation to the compulsory microchipping of dogs. The Minister will recall the debate that I led in Parliament in connection with the serious attack on Brogan McQuaig. Is the Minister seriously advising me that the compulsory microchipping of dogs will actually go a significant step towards ensuring that such attacks don't take place in, in the future? Minister. Uh, well, uh, uh, Mr Martin is perhaps uh, misreading the answer I've just gave, given him. We are working closely with local authorities to develop potential strengthening of the 2010 Act. So this is, this is not in isolation, but certainly microchipping will play a part in ensuring that we can uh, find dogs owners if they're left off the leash, obviously running around and be able to track down the owners. And it's obviously their responsible ownership of the dog, which is partly yes. to blame for incidents that where dog attacks took place. I'm certainly aware of the attack on, on Brogan McCaig and uh, obviously a very distressing and harrowing attack that it was. And I'm happy to work with Mr. Martin on uh, tackling any deficiencies in the law. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister knows, I piloted the Control of Dogs Act, which seeks to bring early intervention to dogs that are deemed to be get, causing anxiety before they may become dangerous. And notwithstanding what the Minister has said about coordination between police and local authorities, my experience is that the public and many professionals are unaware of this legislation. And can I ask for the umpteenth time if the government may publicise this act, which as a member I cannot do? Minister. I should choose my chairs more carefully in future uh, with the supplementaries. Um, <laughs> but uh, for, for, first, uh, firstly, can I, can I thank... Thank you for that. <laughs> Can I thank Christine Graham for, for her work in putting through the Control of Dogs Act. It, it certainly has uh, been enormously helpful to us. Um, but can I also say in relation to publicity, I think the fact that the, the rising number of use of dog control notices is an indication of and growing awareness among local authorities. But clearly, I'm happy to work with the member if there's any specific proposals she has uh, to increase publicity. And I'll choose, uh, choose to do so in, in a time suiting to her. Um, but certainly, yeah, I thank again Christine Graham for, for her work on the Act and look forward to working with her in the future. Presenting. 
Perhaps. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. That ends general questions. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery Professor Manuel Hassassian, the head of the Palestinian Mission in London. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. 